All right, I'll call the meeting of the Sunderland Elementary School Committee to order at 6.04 p.m. and uh, take a motion to approve the minutes of February 24th. So moved. Second. Any comments? Greg, are you there? No. <laughs> I got okay with four of us present. Uh, in favor of approving the minutes, Peter? Yes. Keith? Yes. Maisie? Yes. Jessica? Yes. Approved 4-0. Uh, financials? There we go. And I'll turn it over to Greg. We just approved the minutes and now we're going to do financials. And you're muted. Then I, I found the unmute. Outstanding. All right. Uh, approve the minutes. Outstanding. And uh, financials, by all means. Shelly? Okay. I did not have a formal update this month. Um, I did look over both of those expense reports that I shared with you. Um, there's nothing major to concern. There's no significant changes since we last met. Uh, we're still on a trajectory to have savings this year um, from various sources, whether it's personnel, uh, transportation, or um, the budget freeze that you all agreed to move forward with in January. Um, so there, I'm happy to take questions if you have them, but you know, that's things are basically on track. Um, you did sign 18 warrants totaling $74,763.71. Um, and Sunderland has a new accountant in the um, admin offices. So we are working with that new accountant to make sure all of the COVID expenditures that we submitted under the Municipal Cares Act are either being paid directly to a vendor if the town was to pay the invoice or um, being reimbursed to the school. So you'll see quite a few expenses on the school choice sheet still on the expense report for school choice that are COVID related. Um, so those are the things that I'm working with the town to clean up. Um, that's the biggest update right now on fiscal year 21. Outstanding. Is there anything upside down? <laughs> that's not working out. Oh, I'm such an okay. elementary student. Exactly. Um, yeah, any questions for Shelly regarding that one? I know we're going to get more into financial stuff as we go. All right. Uh, we, apparently, we have no public comment. So is, uh, is Kelsey Crop available to do the Anti-Racism and Equity Committee update? Um, I think as as we normally do when she gets on, we'll 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 go over to her. Um, I would expect her any moment. Sounds good. Uh, how about uh, uh, COVID nineteen update on the agenda? Sure. Um, so a couple of things to go over. Um, I guess the first one is that the you received my um, email out from the commissioner and the I guess commissioner slash governor. Um, regarding the requirement for um, K to K to five, or if your group K to six is K to six schools to return to um, full in-person model, go from the hybrid model to the full in-person model by um, April 5th. Um, that doesn't affect our schools too greatly in the sense that we already have four days a week. Um, Ben's got to do a lot of sh shiftings again of some schedules and we got busing to take care of, and Shelly's working on that with Gribco um, from, you know, picking up another day now going, you know, full five days a week. Um, and it's kind of the major impact. I think it's, again, it's a little exhausting in the sense that we just, we continue to, every single time we kind of get into a flow, we kind of adjust it. But I think we're, I guess you could say, flowing in the right direction. It's good to be able to be able to make changes, um, you know, safely in the direction of getting kids in person. So that part's positive. Um, so that's kind of basically overall what's going on with the return to um, students may still be remote if their family chooses to do so, but it's either all in or all out. Um, and then, um, you know, pool testing is going, is moving along swimmingly. Um, I'm just trying to get a big cut up there. My, um, the question we're going to have is, so it, it's extended through um, vacation. So uh, uh, in April. 
we're not going to have a school committee meeting until May. And so, because we have a joint meeting next month, we may, we will have a public hearing and maybe we could have a quick meeting afterwards and we can add this to there, but we won't have, I don't have the data. Uh, Meg reached out to yesterday to our provider and asked for if they can give us a uh, estimate of cost and they're not done with the bids coming in from the, the arrangement from the state about what they're bidding. It's got to be, a, you know, it's, it's being overseen by the state. So they don't have the documentation to tell us how much it's going to cost yet. So, you know, right now, hunting ahead, I'm probably going to ask in April to extend uh, pool testing until this, the, uh, the committee meeting in May. So that you're talking about three to four weeks of testing. Um, it was 12, nine weeks um, that we would have to pay for in total. Um, originally it was 11. Um, and we're looking at the cost. We think the costs are going to come way down because we don't have to pool as large, I mean, as small as we originally thought because of the way you can then test coming out of the pool and already our experience in having a positive test pool, not in Sunderland, but in another school where we're able to kind of test our way to where the source was and not everybody, you know, you're not having to send multiple grades home all at once. Um, you do the, you know, you do the testing on site and you send those for either close contacts or um, if there were multiple people, which was not the case in the, in the, in our positive that we had in our greater district. Um, we've actually had two positives in our greater district. And again, there was no, there was no school transmission. Um, we're continuing um, as my done that. We're, we're not having any school transmission um, having taken place. So that's kind of coming in a timing wise doesn't work well. <clears throat> With our meetings, but actually, I might be, no, I've already thought out loud. I might be able to add that to the um, public hearing of the budget, which will happen in April, if that makes sense. So, any questions on those two COVID-related items? Anyone? Peter, I just had a question about uh, uh, offering opportunities for. Uh, students who have been fully remote up to now to coming back into the school as to whether that will be allowed or under what conditions. Yep. And so one of the, you know, we had just um, reached out to families in Sunderland to ask them to come if they want to come back four days a week. And part of the email I sent out and with Ben is sending out, if you are interested in returning to in-person model, to please contact. Um, there are, Ben, go ahead, jump in. Yeah. Um, we approximately pre-K through six have close to 60 students, right around 60 students who are still fully remote. Um, I sent out a survey earlier today to all remote families, a non-binding non survey, um, just get, asking them to give us a general sense of where their heads are at, a uh, definite yes, they'll be coming back, maybe, or a, or a hard no. Um, so that's, that's on the table right now. And we're just based on our structure, we are able to pivot pretty quickly if a family needs to switch from remote to hybrid. It's just a, a matter of confirming it with the classroom teacher, making sure we have the supplies ready, and then all of the health forms, necessary health forms um, up to date as well, as some of those haven't been updated because the kid's been remote the entire year. So we, we are ready and prepared for that. Um, in all but really one of our classes, if all of the students in that class were to return, we'd still be able to maintain the six foot distance. If in one particular class that has close to 20 students, we would then need to work something out, but we're not anticipating all 20 students in that homeroom returning for in-person learning. Good. I have a quick COVID related question. Are the tents coming back soon for outdoor education and eating? Yes, the that exact date is to be determined. Um, the, the next step is to uh, survey staff um, to see which grade levels definitely want a tent for, for the spring. Um, you know, in the in the fall, some took advantage of the uh, just based on the structure and number of students, the, the tents more so than others. And so that's that's a discussion that's uh, going to be had with, with staff. But we have two suppliers that are basically ready to go um, if need be. Go ahead, Keith. 
So I just got like kind of two unrelated questions. The first was kind of, uh, off of what Peter was asking. Um, if a family wants to move from remote to in-person as we get into further into May, even into June, will they have the opportunity to? Yes, at, at any point. And really our, our protocols behind that hasn't changed. We've been asking families um, that it may take up to a week and a half for the school to um, be ready to facilitate that change. Um, but, but realistically, it's, it's when we have a desk available um, to make that transition, um, to make that transition happen and all the paperwork. So at any point, a family can request to go from any, in either direction, basically. Excellent. And then the second one was on the, the pool testing uh, for Darius. What, what would we be looking at for um, a ballpark cost? And then the, the, with, with what Shelley was saying, having some savings this year, would we be able to use that for the additional pool testing? So the pool cost, so we got the company that we got Beacon, um, Project Beacon, which is the, if you remember reading that sheet months ago, that was the least expensive um, price per pool. And some of the costs are, you know, escalated. We have positives and we have to do, Keith, I'm getting a lot of feedback from you. I don't know if everybody else is. Um, if, um, just going back for a second. So there's, there's other costs like, the, you know, the individual PCR tests if there's a positive pool. So you got to kind of be prepared for, you know, a couple rounds of positive tests in that. The other, what I don't know is how many pools we will need because when I talked with Meg, she said, yeah, when we started this off, we were like, oh, we're going to create a bunch of small pools. But now we can create larger ones also because the majority of pools are coming back negative. And through all our weeks, we've only had two positive um, two positive pools out of all the multiple pools that we're having. So that we don't have to do like pools of three or four. We can do larger ones, which can reduce costs. Um, so, yeah, I don't even have a rough estimate. And so, um, I mean, I have the, the original estimates. And I'm not going to dig through my paperwork to find it right in front of me now, but I can try to get as many as on. Shelly might have it. She unmuted. Yeah. Unmute. Originally, we had calculated based on 11 weeks, it was going to be about $8,500. Um, but it sounds like we could be less than that. Right. So I guess let's let's round it. Let's make that, you know, uh, uh, 10 weeks. And then you drop a few weeks, you know what I mean? So we're already around probably around $5,000 at those particular budgeted numbers. And those were budgeted at the higher cost. But there are some things that were like sign up and registration fee were these fee lines that were in the original document. And we don't know if we still have to pay those fees, if they're going to zing you with the sign on board feed, or are those going to be waived by the state, which we'll see what happens. Again, Project Beacon is the one company that's a nonprofit um, that's going to donate whatever leftover at the end of this thing back to something. Um, so it is, you know, the positive note is that they may, we're hoping that likely there's not going to be sign up fees and these registration fees and all this other kind of stuff that that, that, put, that other ones had. Um, so yeah, so five grand. We're also show you we'll talk about that we're looking at other federal monies coming. So there might be that might be something we can pay for out of that. Um, I mean, I think we can look at the different other uh the yes sr2 do we use all that we'll get into that but shelly can you so think about that for a second you can talk about when we talk about the budget about covid related expenses the remainder of this year yeah well i i think um for the pool testing we likely have an easy funding source for that so the state gave schools a very small amount of money um, under what they're calling the coronavirus prevention fund um, so Sunderland has not spent any of that yet. I don't have the exact number in front of me. I want to say it's maybe 10,000, um, could be 15,000, um, but it was based on the number of kids enrolled. They gave a certain amount of money, minor amount of money um, per student. So half of that money has come in. We've just set up the new fund at the school level and at the town level. So we can access that if needed. This does have to be spent by June 30th. So, you know, it would be a good spot to, to use for pool testing if we need to. Thank you very much. Any other uh, COVID related questions?
questions? Okay. I, I, yeah, and I'll tack on that. It seems like a, a great uh, use of whatever funds are available, and it's it's gone swimmingly, and uh, it seems to give people a lot of peace of mind. So uh, it feels like it's well worth uh, the investment, and anything that we can do, like has been done to shave the impact off the budget, is is just gravy. Um, all right, Amanda is here. Oh, Peter. Um, just one other thing. Has there been any progress on vaccination for teachers? Well, interesting question, Peter. I just sent out a, the reason I say that is I just like 10 minutes prior to this meeting, 30 minutes prior to this meeting, I had a conversation with Carolyn Ness who talked to me about the Sheriff's Department who has a mobile unit and they've done another um, district in, maybe two districts in the county and they are looking to set up another one and she wanted to see what is the the number of vaccines that we need and so there's a lot of talk in the schools about people who have gotten you know we anecdotally i don't have any collected information because we don't collect that kind of information from our employees um but just in, walking the halls it feels like if i had to give a number two-thirds of our employees have at least had their first shot that's what it feels like um ben i don't know what your your kind of what the feeling is but I did just send out a survey that asked, are you interested in the mobile unit if one would come here um, as early as next week and basically says non-binding, so please um, you know, continue to sign up for other opportunities. And what is your current status? Or if you're not interested or do you already have a shot, you're just not interested at all, or you're completely vaccinated. So kind of a way for us to kind of get a general snapshot of where we are and by school. So I have a general idea, and that's due by, they have to do this by tomorrow morning at 10 because they need a quick turnaround for this this group if they're going to come as early next week next week rather so um i'll have some more you know kind of cleaner information soon on that Good. outstanding all right uh amanda are you going to be giving the anti-rism and uh, equity committee update right. i am take it away please okay hi everyone uh, i hope you're doing well um, so my updates are pretty brief. Um, we recently had two kind of large committee meetings um, with and without kind of administration to discuss the successes that the committee has really been able to accomplish thus far this year. And I think there are a lot of successes and then challenges um to really transition from this was this was a committee that was sort of just in the in the spirit and the momentum of the moment put together but now we're sort of transitioning into like how do we sustain this um so also discussing challenges and some answers that we got was that communication really at all levels has been a challenge. And so to begin to address that, there's plans for a newsletter that has been proposed that's gonna go out to kind of everyone, um, staff, students, families, school committee members, so that everyone is on the same page with what is happening around the district. Um, the school, policy and procedures subcommittee has um, been focused on reviewing existing documents and so that's been a success definitely and so they're now pivoting um, to focus on creating a kind of blueprint for policies procedures um, for responding to incidents incidences involving race. Um, a, a, a success was another success that's been kind of related to the anti-racism committee and just anti-racism work more generally is that the, the professional development at the elementary schools has been very well received. Um, not, to, not to toot my own horn. But it's been really fantastic. <laughs> um, and I think there's a, a common foundation among all of the teachers and staff that I think is really powerful 
um, and we're now getting into the this this term's professional development. And I think the momentum sort of flagged a little bit, but I think now that we're really getting into it, I think everyone is very much kind of back on board. There were some optional professional development dates and that was a bit of a challenge because, you know, teachers are, you know, oh, I want to do this. I really need to do this work. But at the same time, I have all of these other things that I have to worry about. So I'm feeling guilty that I'm not doing this, but I genuinely don't have the time. So that's, we have, we've recognized that, you know, having something optional, particularly right now in the middle of a pandemic is just, it's just an added kind of stressor. And so now that we're into the mandatory professional development, I think there's a lot of momentum that has been regained that I think kind of flagged a bit. Um, and it's been, it's been going very well. So just a general outline is that teachers are kind of taking looks at specific units in their curriculum and kind of combing through, looking for missing perspectives, bias in kind of what is being taught or what is not being taught and beginning to supplement the curriculum with those additional perspectives, additional stories, you know, who can we swap out and who can we bring in to make this more equitable and just a stronger curriculum more generally. Um, there's also the instructional assistants, some of them are doing the pathway work from the fall, which was history of racism or white privilege. You, there's a choice there and some of them are still doing that and others are working on um, kind of a microaggressions toolkit. So as we are having conversations that involve race and difference more and more inevitably that's going to lead to conversations where someone says something that's uncomfortable and IAs are oftentimes the first line of defense there um, with that kind of social emotional response and kind of stewardship over that kind of the mental well-being of the classroom in many ways and so um, some of the IAs have opted to um, do to do that work with with um, building out a toolkit first recon doing a lot of work recognizing unconscious bias recognizing microaggressions kind of laying out what they already do in the classroom when something is said or done and then building a toolkit so that everyone has sort of that common foundation of language so that if something is said or probably more accurately when something is said everyone has common language to be able to address um, address that. So that's going very, very well, I think. Um, and the, the high school teachers are wanting a bit more opportunity to do a similar deep dive that the elementary schools have done and in, in, in effect kind of establish that common foundation, which I think has has been um, not lacking at the secondary level, but I think the staggering of the professional development dates have made that more difficult. Um, and then the next steps that the um, professional development committee um, are going through is finalizing we the committees, the professional development and curriculum committees have merged and they sent along professional development proposals for next year with kind of our all our hopes and dreams for professional development um and so that's that's sort of the next step figuring out what professional development will look like in ideally in conversation with administration and then developing a clear roadmap for what does this work look like what are our goals in the next two, three years, for example. And then the, the kind of at the heart of all of this is just making sure that students of color, no matter how few, no matter how 
far between they may be, but really centering students of color in this entire conversation, because if we make our classrooms and our communities safe for those few students, we are making our classrooms and our communities safe for all of these students. Um, if we if we center the people who are most at the margins, we effectively center everyone. Um, that's how I think of it. And so the goal is, the goal of all of this work is to make our schools more equitable, which it, it goes without saying, but I think is, it goes without saying, but it still should be said. <laughs> um, yeah, so that's, that is my, that is my update. It's been um, fantastic, I think, overall. <laughs> a lot has been done and a lot of good work is yet to be done, but it's, we're getting there. Yeah. So questions or comments or concerns? Go ahead, Peter. Oh. Um, I just had a question as to, uh, I don't know if there are ways in which you can measure progress that you may be making, or if it's just a sense that you have that you're making progress or that every, you know, a general feeling. I, I don't know what measuring is, is available. Yeah, it's definitely, um, anecdotally, I can tell you that it feels very powerful, but more concrete metrics are being used and it's not just my my gut feeling gut response so for example kim mccarthy who's uh the curriculum director sent out a survey uh essentially asking you know how important is this work how do you feel you've changed um about this by this work it was a very general kind of survey but i think it was something kind of and very impressive with like 80% of people saying that, you know, this had had a positive response to the professional development, either positive or very positive. Um, so that's very significant, I think. Um, and I also, um, at the at the beginning of last term and at the end of last term, I had teachers do a survey for professional development. And because last term was um, mostly about, you know, internal work and internal understanding or individual understanding, I should probably say, of issues of race and also um, having conversations about race with colleagues. And I, it, I went through those survey responses and um, out of everyone who responded, there were, I, I actually tallied it up. It was almost 60. So about a third of the people said that they don't know, they asked for help. Um, they're saying, I'm unsure of how to do this. So I don't understand. So this kind of sentiment of help, I, I'm not sure it's undetermined. And then by the end, there was um, a kind of serve or a tally out of 10 points, how would you say, how would you rate your individual understanding of issues of, you know, race, racism, and there was I think at the beginning it was like a five out of 10 people said on average. And then at the end it was a seven out of 10. So no one is saying that their knowledge is 10 out of 10, which is good <laughs> because no one's knowledge is 10 out of 10. But that, that notable shift of, wow, I, I am so much more aware um, is very significant. So there's, there's the anecdotal, but there's also the, we we are not just going off of my gut feeling <laughs> in tracking progress, um, but yeah, it's so there's there's a I think demonstrable improvement overall, or just a w improvement of awareness. Yeah, thanks for that question, Peter. Jessica, you had one. Yeah, uh, first I just want to say thank you. I, 
you're fabulous. <laughs> We're so lucky to have your thoughtful and enthusiastic leadership on this. Um, my, my question was, you, you talked about planning professional development for next year. Is that professional development something that new staff members can just drop into, or should we be planning some sort of like on-ramp for them into this work? I, oh, that's a fantastic question. That's something that we started to discuss in the curriculum professional development committees. I think even next year, it will be something that people can drop into. I think it's still going to be very foundational. That's definitely the sense that I got. Um, but so I think in short, I should say, I don't know. Um, but I, my, the sense that I got from having kind of worked with designing these, the outlines, the potential outlines for these professional developments is that it'll still be very foundational and what people who are new to the district won't feel, you know, like fish, fish out of water if they're new to this work. But that's definitely something that was raised for consideration for you know future years going forward and i think it's something that we will have to discuss more because it was mentioned and then <laughs> we didn't have time <laughs> um yeah. Yeah. I can just pass out one suggestion um just to help make this a very long-term commitment for the district to continue doing this work um i once worked in a district that had a a required course for new teachers to do in their first three years in the district and to make that um, sort of more appealing to the new staff, um, they offered to give graduate credits towards column advancement. Um, Darius and Ben know what I'm talking about, um, so that it could it could help lead to a raise for for teachers in the future. That's a way to make it fit into the lives of new staff. Sometimes they're first year teachers who are who are busy and overwhelmed, and mm -hmm. yeah. But there there are ways to to help them fit it into their lives, or or at least incentivize it. Thank you again. Go ahead, Keith. So Amanda, thank you. I just want to um, add on to for the, the professional development, just the one thing to keep in mind, and I heard you say it, which I really appreciate, is teachers combing through their curriculum. So some of the, the difficulties I've encountered in the past is to get a great two and a half hour seminar, and then I got 20 minutes to go into my curriculum and try to do some stuff with it. So I think the most important thing, one of the most important things is providing the time for the teachers to actually go into the curriculum and like you said, comb through the curriculum. And I think really, especially like math and science is gonna be a little bit more difficult to try to find those, those areas. I think, you know, uh, uh, English language arts, social studies, it's a little bit more applicable. And I think the harder thing is it's, it's a little bit easier to put your finger on, this is an area I have to improve but then it gets a little bit harder with what do I put in there? And it's because you have to go out and do that research and do the hard mm -hmm. work for the teachers to have the time to actually be able to, to like you said, go through the curriculum. Outstanding. Anything else? Any other questions? Thank you, Amanda. Appreciate mm -hmm. it. Thank you all. Have a wonderful evening. You as well. Okay, so uh, fiscal year 22 budget proposal. Okay, so I shared a, oh, Greg, I will send you the Excel spreadsheets of everything. Sorry, my brain is not trained for that yet, but I'll share them with you. Um, so I sent the PDF of the full budget today, and then I sent you the Google Doc to the narrative, which I believe Darius is going to share his screen so we can go over that narrative. All right, so I just gave you the reminders here of where we started to where we currently are. Um, so prior to this meeting, uh, at the last meeting we had, not the select board meeting, but our actual meeting, um, we did talk about uh, being at that 6.66%, uh, moving some things around, um, putting school choice expenses back where they belonged on general fund from the prior year, uh, 
manipulation of, of our expenditures. Um, so we also talked about the budget freeze. Uh, we're looking at needing to save about $87,000 in support of next year's budget from the FY21 budget. Uh, out of district placement and then we decided to request that the town pay the $50,000 retirement expense. Um, so coming into this meeting we were looking at a 6.66% increase or just shy of $200,000. Um, obviously that includes the COLA adjustments, all of the raises that we talked about, any column movement, um, increases for insurances or other expenditures just to give you a little recap there. Um, and then, as I said up above, we have the school lunch wages and the early childhood wages that are also included in that figure because those revolving accounts cannot support um, those wages being paid from those accounts next year, given the hardship we face during COVID. Um, so if we scroll down a little bit, I'm not going to go through this chart, but I wanted you to see the chart so that you could see the differences in each of the DESE function codes. Um, and how they're broken down. I am happy to take questions about any of them if you have questions, because I know some of those numbers, you know, some are up and some are down. So happy to take individual questions if you have them, but I'm not gonna read through that entire piece. Um, what I do wanna get into more importantly is how we bring that 6.66% down, um, because I, I think it was clear at the select board meeting um, that we need to continue to work on that number. So we're at a point of how do we do that? Um, and I don't remember without looking what our first step was. Um, if you don't mind scrolling down for me again, Darius. Um, so the first step in looking at this here was to talk with Ben about current classroom sizes. Uh, we had added in a teacher, which was a $55,000 cost um, for a potential uh, second section of a grade, particular grade. I want to say it might have been first grade, but I could be wrong there. Um, but at this point, based on the class sizes, we're not going to need that additional section. So I have gone ahead and removed that expense from the budget. Um, and then also with that, because we're not going to need that second section, we can reduce one of our IAs. So that was about um, a $75,000 reduction there. Uh, so then the next step, we talked a little bit about this at our last meeting, but we didn't have numbers yet. And then I gave you an update at Select Board. Um, there is a fund coming in to us that we could apply for it now to use some of the funds in FY21. I don't believe we need it. Um, I think it'll be most fiscally responsible to use it next year in 22, although we can continue to use it for another year um, and few months. So it's the ESSER 2 fund. It's a federal grant coming in in support of um, COVID relief. And Sunderland will receive, there's an $85,000 award, but 10,000 we are required to spend on um, essentially mental health services for students and, and faculty or staff where that's needed most in there. And then the 75,000 is at our discretion within the eligible expenditures. And one of those eligible expenditures um, would include salaries and wages. So it's my recommendation that we spend that full 75,000 next year. Um, that will cover uh, and this addresses one of Peter's questions that came in through email. So that will cover the full school lunch wages, which was um, about $31,000 that we had added to the general fund budget. We had added $45,000 in early childhood wages. So we won't quite cover all of that. Um, I'm sorry, I think cafeteria was 41 um, and, and early childhood was 45. So we're gonna cover the full cafeteria and then the rest, which is about 31,000 for the early childhood. So we're still gonna see a little bit of the early childhood wage expense on the general fund, um, but 14 to 15,000 versus you know the full 45,000 is a more palatable number for us. Um, and then the goal will be to move those expenses back to those revolving accounts the following year. Um, which I think Peter also addresses one of your other questions. You know, we are looking at, based on what we know right now, given we're going back five days, that the fall also looks like five days. Um, and while we're still waiting for guidelines on um, particularly early childhood and what EEC and DESE is going to say for regulations there, we do expect that our class sizes will grow. Um, and if that's the case, obviously, we will have revenue stream coming in. Um, 
I would caution us in using that next year because I think it would be most fiscally responsible to build that fund back up again so that we have some reserves in the event of unforeseen ex, um, expenses, particularly special ed needs that could pop up at the early childhood age. Um, and save those to support the FY23 so that we can really move those back given that in 22, we have a way to cover those expenses. School lunch is a little bit more unknown. Uh, we do not know at this point if the USDA is going to extend the free lunches for all. I don't imagine that they will. I, I would think coming back in the fall that school lunch will be able to have some um, additional local revenue coming in on top of the state and federal reimbursement that we will continue to receive for free and reduced lunches. Um, but it's a little bit harder to predict. But again, our goal is that by FY23, if not the full wages, um, at least a portion of the wages could go back on the revolving fund. Uh, and I know you all know this, you know, normally we wouldn't use one time influx of cash from a grant or other funding source to cover wages that may have to be put back on a general fund in following years. But I think because these are revolving accounts and we are expecting revenue to come back in and the programs to build back up, this is a safe and responsible way to use this funding. Um, so that's the second recommendation. So that dropped us down there. Um, and with that, you know, we've had several conversations about being more uh, responsible with school choice spending, making sure that we're not overexpending the annual amount that we're bringing in for revenue. Um, we're still going to be over that, but given the changes up above, I think it's a good idea for us to reallocate some of the expenses that we had put on school choice um, back to the general fund. And so the recommendation there, and this is a very specific number because it relates to exact people and wages, which is why it's 44,342. Um, I could have rounded it, but I like to try to be exact in these figures. So um, if we move that back over at the end of next year, and Peter, I did add that chart at the bottom for the school choice number, so we can look at that, but we would be looking at um, just shy of 250,000 at the end of next year, which is far better than the projection that we talked about at the last school committee meeting. Um, so with all three of those pieces, uh, the budget snapshot changes pretty significantly. We started out at 6.66% increase, and with all of those changes, we're looking at a 2.75% increase, which I think is a much um, easier number for all of us to digest and hopefully for the towns to digest. Um, just a reminder here that there, there are some assumptions that we're going to be able to save the 87000 in this year's budget, uh, which I am keeping a close eye on, but I, you know, anything could come up. There's still several months of school left. Um, there's also the assumption that we need to uh, get the town will approve that warrant that we're asking for to pay that $50,000 retirement benefit and that our enrollment and class sizes don't change significantly where we would need a new teacher or a new IA. Um, you know, Ben doesn't feel right now that that's necessary, but you know, you never know if something could change and, and that could um, cause some fluctuation in the budget there. Um, and then Darius did talk about that there, it looks like there's going to be additional federal relief coming. We don't know what that looks like yet. Um, Darius heard that it could double um, the ESSER 2 amounts for some districts. Um, so if we do get those funds and the budget is not approved and we know more about that number, obviously we can take another look at this and see how we support next year's budget. Or if it's a multi-year, do we wait and use that funding to support FY23, um, which really might be our best choice. Um, or we could also look at reducing school choice expenses and saving more school choice in support of future years. Uh, and then the last piece here is uh, the school choice projection, just adding those in at your request, Peter. So you can see there, we're looking at rolling over, uh, which does include the savings from this year's budget that we've been talking about. Uh, rollover 341,000. Revenue is estimated right now on the cherry sheets at 346,000. Expenses you can clearly still see are higher than revenue. However, we are bringing those down, I think, with discussions little by little. Um, so at the end of the year, we would be looking at 246,000 if the budget was approved and accepted and passed it the way that it stands right now. Um, before I take your questions, I just want to look through Peter's comments and make sure I addressed everything. I think the only other piece that's not addressed in here is you had the question, Peter, about any revenue coming back to us from the state with that out of district placement. 
Um, and the answer there is yes. Uh, however, I don't foresee it helping us in fiscal year 22, because what happens with circuit breaker funding is you have to expend out the year, submit your claims, and then we will get the funding hopefully in late June um, or July, but it's based on the prior year's numbers. So I think our expenses are already going to be you know, done and gone by the time we see the money. And I don't think we want to count on a particular number to support next year without knowing what the exact claim would be. Um, but that could help us in fiscal year 23 because we will get a payment in. And what it what Circuit Breaker works out to be is there's a minimum amount that foundation number that you have to spend before they kick in any extra. So that's around 45,000, 43 to 45,000. And then what they do from there is the difference. So in our case, we'd be looking at 35,000. The state will reimburse up to 70%. So that could be about 25,000 that we receive back in circuit breaker money that could help us for the following year. Um, I don't think unfortunately it'll help next year, but you know, it's something for us to plan and look forward to uh, in the future. And again, this is a one time this student will be a sixth grader next year so we won't be looking at this unless something else comes up obviously um, for future years uh, so that is where we're at currently happy to take questions feedback comments concerns peter, peter. Just, just on the the item that you mentioned the the circuit breaker um i realized that it wasn't really available until fy 23 the money coming back from the state the question was is that something that by default sort of goes onto the town's books or does it go onto the school books? It's definitely school funding. Okay. Yeah. So we don't have to like beg to get it back, you know, make a case. No. We, you know, we had the expense and so we ought to get the, okay. I just want to check down the road if that was going to be a problem. No, it's a really good question, but it definitely comes back to us. Okay. As and, a school. and then I'd mentioned that in terms of one of your assumptions, uh the second one was that the town would uh go for the covering the fifty thousand dollars roughly of retirement costs um and to that i would just say that at, at the last night's select board meeting they heard the budget presentation of the franklin technical school and scott asked the question because they have a chunk of retirement costs built into their budget and so scott asked the question about whether there were uh, costs that were similar to what we have here, buyouts for teachers at retirement, and should they be moved out of the general fund because it tends to disguise things and, you know, the argument and, and so on. And so he was pushing them to do the same thing that he said we've done here in our district, which he was very much in favor for. So having heard him say that, um, it seems to me very likely that, yeah, they're going to go for that because that's the way they want to do it. So I think that was, that was a good sign as far as getting them to approve, you know, putting the 50,000 on a separate Warren article. Great. Um, I don't think Franklin Tech wanted to do it because they would have to get approval from what, 19 towns or something like that and 19 different numbers, whatever. So but in any case, Scott clearly likes doing it this way, and I think that's important to know. Indeed. Go ahead, Jessica. All right, I've got two questions. The first one I think is pretty straightforward. You mentioned $75,000 of CARES Act money, and I know the CARES Act was months ago, and you said there might be more federal funding coming in the near future. Um, is, is the... The maybe in the near future part, the recent COVID Relief Act? Yeah, I think whatever Biden recently signed, there was some language in there and I don't know the specifics of it and I don't know how much Massachusetts gets and then how Massachusetts breaks it down from there, but there was some language in there about additional relief for schools. And this new money is a second award. So what I'm talking about this 75,000 now is separate from what they gave us in the fall, which was based on Title I funding. So we didn't see a ton there. Um, so this would be a third package potentially. They Great. said in the, I, it was on a state meeting and Bill Bell, who's the DESE um, finance guy, he basically said, you know, we are looking at numbers, uh, maybe two times our S or two money. 
that we can expect two times the extra two money if it goes through as the way it was put, was put together. Right? So we're waiting to see what that has. So there's there's some more money coming. Um, as I think it, what it gives me confidence is that we can use the SR2 money up this year, um, you know, bank that stuff and the, the, you know, relieve some of our school choice, which makes sense because use the money you got and you're saving the other money that you're going to be able to expend how you want anyways. While there are some rules to SR2, they're kind of open, but as we move further to COVID, I get concerns about COVID related expenses and tying it to it next year, you know, um, Although Shelly says it's pretty open, we'd probably be fine either way. But um, you know, using the the ESSER two this year, I'm calling it ESSER three in our meetings with Shelly, just so we have a, a title with the no, next level of money coming is called. But ESSER three, maybe it'll be even more, and that could help us. We'll deal with that good problem um, should it arrive. Great. And then my my other question is kind of related to that that, that we're getting. These pots of one-time money. What does a year from now look like? It looks like our we're projecting our school choice line is going. Our our, our ending balance will be lower than the starting balance. Um, it, it's amazing we've gotten it down to two point seven five percent. Is is that too low to be planning for the future? Are we just going to have another budget emergency a year from now? Shelly and I went back and forth. She's yelling at me right now, quietly. She's yelling at me. We went back and forth because she had this paragraph that we removed that basically said, yeah, folks, we didn't solve any problems this year, is basically what it said. And we're going to be in the same boat next year because we continue in this cycle of barely making it through a budget season. Um, you know, and, and some of the factors I think that, you know, we're looking at is that, you know, Sunderland is getting creamed by Sunderland, by Frontier's assessment this year. While it's not our problem, it is our problem because we work jointly with all the budgets coming in. Um, so, well, I, it's really my problem, so I can't say, but you know what I'm saying. <laughs> um, so, you know, they are looking for some, they're not looking, you know, they're we're looking for some relief as well. So, um, you know, we, yeah, we did kind of say like, it doesn't solve next year, we're gonna roll in um, the good, you know, and there is risk in this. You know, we we have seen enrollment trends go way up, as Ben will attest to, um, and then all of a sudden we need to hire a teacher, and so that's why it's important that you know we roll the savings into school choice, is kind of knowing that there's a possibility that we may need either a new <clears throat> teacher or we get a class where we say, okay, maybe another IA, and we can hold at a higher number with another adult in the room. You know, those kind of different scenarios, all depending on the grade level and the needs of the students. So I'm not trying to project that, but yeah, Peter, I think you were looking to maybe jump in on that. Well, uh, I just I just want to add that that in the FY22 numbers on school choice, there's 80,000 for an out of district placement that's going away. So that if you look at just if you just push those numbers forward, then you're 80,000 better. You're more you're much closer to like a balance in school choice than it would look like. It looks like you're just starting another deep hole, but it's only, you know, a big chunk of that's one-time money. That's a good reminder, thanks. Um, were there any savings available, the fact that we have now converted this student to an out-of-district placement? Is there savings in special ed costs in one way or another, or um, anything that, is any, of any significance? No, my understanding is there's no savings for us as far as budget. We will see some circuit breaker reimbursement this year for it. However, the student moved mid year. And so it's, you know, to keep the numbers easy without having them in front of me, half the tuition, and then you've got to meet that mark before they even reimburse. So, you know, we might be lucky to see five grand you know, something like that. But um, I think that's the only other influx from this particular situation. Yeah, I mean, uh, just for myself, uh, I think it was a couple of select board meetings ago, uh, there was a comment when we came in with a, the 6.6 .6 number that, well, it's, it's easy when you're on the demand side to ask for more. Uh, Shelly, as far as I can tell, there's nothing easy about your job. And that goes also for 
for Ben and Darius and all the staff who have been so creative and in working uh, on these uh, to reduce the cost. The very last select board they talked about, uh, uh, it was sort of the first one where they had a sense of where the town was at with any confidence. And they talked about looking at a, a $350,000 hole they're trying to dig out of. So, um, but I, I also think that uh, the point you made, Jessica, and also the, what Shelley was apparently said behind the scenes that Darius is, uh, it's definitely important if we go in with lower numbers to explain that we are kicking the can down the road. Uh, and, uh, you know, this is, this is uh, we're not solving anything with these budgets that have come in just at the uh, two and a half percent threshold long term. Uh, I, I feel like we have to have a, a conversation with finance about the finance committee because there's always a little bit of sticker shock every year. And yet, if you do the math out of time, like you say, you look at the steps, you look at the COLA and uh, definitely there's, there's a lot of noise on the signal in terms of one-time expenses, special education, certainly Corona has thrown all kinds of, of noise into the bunch of stuff, but the overall trend, uh, you know, we need to find a longer term solution, uh, but I definitely am so impressed that you got this down to the a projected 2.75. Keith? Yeah, I'll echo your comments. Um, so I just, so going from the 6.6 .6 to the 2.75, um, so that's, that's a reduction of probably around 120,000 roughly I'm just looking at, based on that, that the four percent is that you have 118, 198. So we're looking at a, a, a reduction of about 120 thousand dollars. So that I'm just trying to play with with the 350 thousand, the the hole that the town was talking about. That it, it does help them out a lot. I also think back to the um, comment about the override that we had a couple of years ago, um, 300 thousand dollar override, and there was a comment about that didn't fix things. And I and I I do recall that we never uh, approached it that that was going to fix everything but that that was a step in a multi-year process. And I think I would echo Greg's comment about having some sort of a meeting with finance committee in that vein that we, this was a first step in a longer process. And we, I, I don't think we want to paint that, that override as we're, we're finished and done. We want to think we want to make very clear that this is a, a process that we're going through and to try to, especially with the school choice to, to get it balanced. So I, I would be happy to have that. And, and, the other thing is I appreciate the process that we're taking because one of the things is philosophically, I feel like we have to bring the town what we think it takes to uh, fund the school rather than just come in with like 2% and we're going to you know, bang that round peg into a square hole. We have to come to the town and say, this is what it actually takes. And then we can work from there. And if we have to knock it down, we'll do what we can. But I think that's part of also having a very honest budget as well. Yeah, those are all really great points. And I, I think it's important to keep our mind on something that Greg said is, you know, the, the cost of living adjustments for teacher and IA contracts alone is about 2.2% of this budget. So that it, it will be impossible for us to do. I think somebody at this select board meeting that we presented at said, how about a 2.5% budget? Well, that means nothing else is addressed. And the school has needs. You know, we put off hiring a team lead last year because we, you know, needed to level fund. That need is still there, but we haven't even talked about it because it's we know it's just not feasible. Um, and there are other needs. There's building needs. You know, I know I'm not telling you guys anything that you don't already know, but I do think that, you know, the town has to hear those things over and over again and and try to give us the support that we need to come up with some numbers that help advance the school in some way we're not we don't we don't want to stay just status quo necessarily i and i also got thrown we got lucky I, 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 there's, there's a little bit finally some luck rolled sunderland's way i'll be honest the way kind of luck seems to be running on budgets the fact that we don't need a teacher and an ia in that position this particular year because of the enrollment shift in a town where we have up and downs of enrollment, um, 
I mean, that's that's over, you know, that's two, you know, two thirds of that savings is right there. And then ESSER money coming from the federal government. I mean, totally two things completely out of our control kind of fell nicely within this budget. So it's not as though we, I just want to say, you know, um, we didn't go back, sharpen our pencils. We went back and we were given data that we didn't have two months ago in that kind of fixed, it kind of fixed kind of where we're at. So we're fortunate and that, you know, that luck could turn again in the sense that we're, you know, we have greater student needs and greater numbers. But I also just want to piggyback at Greg, we've never been in a better position. And I just throwing a compliment Shelley's way. When I started this job, I wanted to have the meetings with Sunderland to talk about long-term planning, but I didn't have the capacity to understand what it was going to take based out of our own books and not to throw Shelley under the bus of future work. But Shelley has the understanding now that we're in year two. She's done your budget probably 14 times in two years. Um, you know what I mean? In the sense of remember last year, the year before. So but she really has an idea of, you know, to bring an educated response in those conversations, but we didn't have that um, early on uh, a few years ago. So I think we're primed for next year to do that. And it doesn't hurt she's a resident. Peter, do you have something? Yeah, I'm maybe less pessimistic about, you know, looking forward. I think that uh, maybe I'm thinking back to, I think I'd been on this committee for about a year and I was, because I came on just at the start of uh, a budget season and a, and a year later, uh, having been on for one year, the budget that was presented to us as a proposed thing in January, February, showed an ending ending school choice position of, I believe, $25,000. Okay, and also looking ahead to needing another teacher and so on. And so we were going to be way out spending our school choice revenue and ending the year with 25000 And I look at that situation compared to where we are now. And, you know, you could say, well, it's still not good, but why it's way better than it was. And um, I also um, look at the numbers, you know, if, if you... I, I look at the school choice ending your balance as a proxy for sort of how much, you know, uh, room we have for, for, for looking ahead, um, not for the year we're talking about, for future years. And that number is going in the right direction. Okay. And it may not be where you'd like to have it, but it's going in the right direction. And so I don't look at this as um, any sort of, well, you're digging the hole deeper or anything like that. Um, I think that, uh, as Darius says, there's been a couple of very fortunate things that we have, uh, that have come our way, including a lot of outside funding. Um, I think we're using it appropriately. I think we're, we're using it to uh, solve problems that are related to COVID, like with our revolving funds and, and so on. And I think that's actually the right way to do it. Um, so you know, I feel I feel pretty optimistic about this. It doesn't mean you know, okay, great, we don't have to struggle anymore. But I feel like, gee, we are actually in as good a position as we've been for some time, and that's particularly the case if the numbers on enrollment don't come back and turn around and bite us. Okay, if they if that then I sort of if that happens, then I take some of that back. But as it is, you know, I look at it and think, yeah, you know, this is this is this is something I won't be staying up you know, thinking about in the middle of the night, how are we going to deal with it? Because it's better than we've been. So the trend, I think, I like the, I, I really like the trend, even though, you know, we got lots to do. And there's lots of stuff, like you say, the team leader that, you know, that's hadn't even been on the table this year. And uh, I'm sure Ben's got other stuff that he would like to have. But I think we're, we're, we're doing certainly better than we might be doing. I'm I'm blanking on the name. The uh, doctor, uh, she stepped in briefly as sort of interim to do our oh, Judy Hall. Yeah, no, yes, yes, Judy, exactly. Um, yeah, I, I definitely agree with you, Peter. That we, you know, sometimes we're good and sometimes we're lucky, uh, and the the trend is in the right direction. But she definitely, Doctor Hall indicated that. Uh, you know, it, it would be a while before we were really well again to where there was a buffer. So I, I agree with you that, uh, you know, we are in a better shape than we were at that time, uh, but there's not a lot of travel in the shock absorbers. Uh, and, and that's something that, given the noise on the signal, given that there's a trend that we can sort of predict 
and then there are the completely unpredictable things that come down. Uh, we don't have enough padding to where we could deal with so, uh, another run of bad luck, which is kind of where we, you know, I think Dr. Hull is indicating it will take you several years to get to that point and, and just engage and, and help people to understand that that's kind of where we're at. Can I ask a question? I'm just curious which grade it is that we're thinking that we only will need one classroom for. Is, is that a public thing? Or if it's not public, that's fine. You know, I withdraw the question. Um, uh, first grade. So between our two kindergarten classes right now, we have 16 students. Okay. I believe you'll see those numbers when we talk about school choice, right, Ben? Is that in your form? <clears throat> yes. So Darius, do we need any direction to move forward here, given that we're talking about an April public hearing? Are we ready for that? Does school committee want us to do more work? We want to wait longer and... Well said, Shelley. So what we're going to need from school committee this evening <laughs> is basically a, you don't have to vote anything, but I, I would think probably a soft vote in the sense of that you're, you're just to make sure you're you're talking amongst each other about, you know, our next right now we're looking about having our public hearing on the budget. Let me put my calendar here on my thing here, so I get this correct. But I believe it is the. You already know Shelly, and you're just waiting and watching me, or do you? My, you know, it's not my. I gotta look at my wall here. The thirteenth of April. We are looking at the 13th of April as having our public hearing. Well, I I mean, can we do our, you know, we've done a straw vote before in, in, in lieu of a formal motion and so on to, you know, I would, speaking for myself, I think, yeah, this is, we ought to go forward with this. I agree. Yeah, I agree. I'm in favor of moving this forward. I agree. Keep Unanimous. All right. So, my question up here. Um, yeah. So, our next meeting would be the. Uh, I'll set the the public hearing on that. You'll have a joint prior to that, um, but you're not really. You can't really talk about. We can't do what we did in the past with the joint meetings where you can break off and go to other rooms. I don't know unless someone can figure out how we do that technologically to have breakout rooms that still allow public meeting where the public could follow it. I, I can't wrap my head around that. So. Um, you know, we're gonna have a joint meeting. Frontier has a little business that has to be done afterwards. Um, uh, spring sports have to be voted before they start at the after vacation. Jessica, you have to. Would it would it have to be broadcast live? Because we could certainly just have have a breakout room and record it. But I, I don't know about easily streaming it. But you, I can I can find that out. I, I can look. I can ask what the what the rules are on that. Because I know that at least you have to record, but you need to broadcast when you can kind of deal. So I can see where that is. I mean, again, if you need a meeting, because you also would have the ability, you know, we'll have. So basically what I'll do is I will post a regular meeting following the public hearing. So that way we have the public hearing then we'll have a regular meeting. You know, um, how we've done another one, usually the only thing on the agenda of that regular meeting is the budget. To, if we have a public hearing and we get a lot of new information, you you can you can still table the vote. You don't have to vote directly following a public hearing. You could have a meeting the following week and say we want to we want to do these particular changes based on the public hearing. Um, and you know, Shelly Darius, go make those changes, bring it back, and then we have another meeting to then vote the budget. You don't have to have a second public hearing. You only need to have one. But you got to be pretty darn close to where you. I think you have to be within. I don't think there's any rule, but you know, basically you're presenting what you would be an honest budget to the public. <clears throat> Does that make sense? So, so are, you thinking, are you thinking of the public hearing after the joint meeting or the public hearing a week later and standing on its own? Right now, the public hearing is set for April 13th. Okay. And, the, okay, and I, gotta, I have to know that two weeks in advance because I have to post it in the newspaper and such. Okay. So... That's when we have, you know, 
we kind of like do a double public hearing to be honest it's kind of we go to the select board and, and finance committee as a separate meeting with them and then we have a public hearing some other the towns say hey finance committee and the select board come to our public hearing let's all together have a conversation about the budget and where we're at um, this year was particularly i didn't mind at all because of the significant numbers we were coming in with they've been kind of they've shifted since then that's fine but it's a lot of extra meetings I just got to put it out there when we do it five, when we do it four times rather. Right. Um, but anyway, so we have a public hearing, which will be the, the 13th at six o'clock. And then directly following the public hearing, close the public hearing, we open a regular school committee meeting. Right now, the only agenda item would be the, the 2022 um, budget, if that makes sense. And if we have to add something to it, we certainly can add to that agenda, but um, we usually keep it clean. Good deal. All right, anything else on the FY22 budget? All righty. Then I guess uh, on to uh, an update of the uh, early childhood playground. And Ben, is that? Great. So over the weekend, I believe, no, actually, Monday morning, I shared with the committee um, the presentation that I had put together for um, the early childhood playground uh, are the community preservation committee meeting, which is being held tomorrow night. And I'm just going to pull that up now. And so we can kind of walk through it together. Okay, so the, the original playground estimate came in at just under $410,000. And up to this point, uh, as of last week, we had reduced that estimate by a total of uh, $68,483. Now that reduction does not include the built-in contingency and contractor O&P costs. Uh, additionally, um, based on feedback from the last CPC, CPC meeting, they asked us what it would look like if we were to divide this project up into phases. So we we did that as well. Um, and uh, we're saying that for phase one, that could potentially cost around $260,708. Phase two would be around 34522 And phase three, an additional 17673 with, with the phases, um, the way we were able to divide it up um, featured like the a absolute necessities, what we needed to have in phase one just to make the, the project work. Additionally, on March 5th, I met with the grant compliance coordinator for the Massachusetts Office on Disability. And during that uh, very informative discussion, they talked about how competitive the ADA grant process is. They receive around 200 applications each year uh, with award, award amounts averaging between 40 and $60,000 and between 35 and 50 applications are chosen um, in, in total out of those 200 uh, total applications. Um, only around one to three applications receive approximately $100,000 or more. So as far as uh, the components of the playground that would qualify for the ADA grant, it's the asphalt walkway, the play structure, the port and play surfacing, the spinner, and then a couple um, freestanding play elements as well. Also in that uh, discussion, uh, one thing in the past that we had mentioned is that the uh, ability to access the grant is contingent upon uh, support coming from the town, that's actually no longer the case. And it doesn't matter what the town is contributing, they do look at each application uh, separately. We're also able to submit multiple ADA grants in one cycle. So for example, we could have, we could just be applying for the uh, safety surface, the port in place, um, a one-time cost of $35,000 or we could include another application that would be the port and play surface and the main play structure or any combination. 
And she said, and, he, and the grant compliance officer mentioned that some applicants really look to do that in, in each cycle. What else here? Uh, what makes for a, a town uh, a strong application? Uh, some towns have completed the ADA self-evaluation and, and we have. Um, in, of, of important note in that uh, report, there's a couple different sections that specifically mention the um, different parts of the uh, school that need support. And one is the, the playground. So we're, we're right on the, the right path for that. Additionally, um, they talked about having some support from outside groups. And prior to our uh, applying for the grant, I'll be reaching out to our Special Education Parent Advisory Council to bring them up to speed to help um, help that group of parents advocate for this project. So also of important note is that projects need to be completed in the same grant season. So we'd be looking at FY22 that the uh, project would need to be completed. Part of this process has been seeking in-kind uh, donations and that includes uh, reaching out to local businesses and town departments and so this chart features a summary of what we have up to this point and and then the cash that we have available right now is just under eighteen thousand dollars and that's from a couple different grant options there's some uh, monetary gift that we recently received there's some money in the student activity fund that has been earmarked for the playground project as well. And then next steps, um, I'm working with a Sunderland parent on some additional fundraising options and we're meeting in the coming weeks to where we hope to raise uh, possibly an additional $25,000 for this project. So here's a summary of the project cost. The original estimate was $409,000 and change reduction so far and remember that's not including the contingency and the contractor O&P, uh, subtracting 68,000 from that. Cash available, uh, a little over 20,000. Actually, that number needs to be updated that uh, the cash available is closer to 18,000. And this is a soft number, the ADA grant. And um, obviously that's money that is not in hand um, and neither is the additional funds that we hope to raise. So between the two of those, that's an additional $75,000. And we're hoping through volunteer labor, we can uh, subtract the total cost by $25,000 more and reset the cont contingency to 5%. And uh, when I met or had a conversation with a local contractor, they said that, you know, if we're really looking to control the costs, the 15% contingency, which was quoted in the original estimate, um, around $40,000 can really be reduced. And so that's kind of where we're at right now. And I guess I'll open it up to, to questions and I'll stop presenting. And so the presentation is tomorrow, tomorrow evening. Outstanding. Shelly, I'm not, how'd I do? You had more color, which we appreciated. Thank you. Peter, you got something? Go ahead. Yeah, I went to the uh, to the meeting uh, a month ago with the CPC. I guess it's the name of the committee, but they give out the CPA money. And um, uh, since that time, and they had some. Uh, they had a bunch of questions and they tended to, I actually, Ben had to go when I stayed to listen to them talk about several other projects that are applying for funding in this year's cycle. And they were asking them some hard questions too. And so uh, Ben's done a ton of work over the last month in terms of putting together some good numbers and a good presentation and so on and so forth. So it, it looks, uh, it's just a lot of progress. Um, on the other hand, just you know, sort of as a separate issue. I 
you know, I sort of feel like I know this this playground is actually, if you look on the school improvement plan that the school council produces, getting the playground done is on that list of things that we're trying to get done. And I sometimes, I guess I asked Ben at some point, I said, Ben, you're sort of a lone wolf here. It seems like you, you know, you're dealing with this, but without much help from people. And um, I just sort of wonder what should be um, being done to help out here from the central office and from, you know, Bill Hildreth and, and whoever else in terms of, you know, how we, you know, how we move, keep moving this forward, because um, I don't know what sort of uh, what we're going to get from a uh, response from the uh, committee tomorrow evening. Uh, it may be that because our whole budget cycle is essentially a month and a half later than it would normally be that uh, they may put off a decision for another month and come back and still want more stuff and so on. So I just, um, you know, I'm hoping that, that Ben can get what, you know, support he needs in terms of keeping pushing this thing. Um, Cause I think, you know, that would be good. And I, again, I'm not sure specifically what it just seemed to me that, you know, I said at some point, Ben, look, I says, I know what, you know, I, I, I'm good at knowing sometimes what questions to ask, but I don't know how to build anything. And he was sort of saying, yeah, he didn't really know how to build anything either. Um, but he's doing a bunch of stuff here. But, you know, I, I just feel like we need to get him more help. So I'm not sure if anyone else has any thoughts about this. Darius, I guess it starts. You yeah, know. I think. I don't know what's, what's he needs, happening. He needs the money. And, and that's basically what we're waiting on is, is we need the the the. the we need, we need two things to happen. Well, multiple things to happen. You have a lot of things in place in order to keep it really low, lower cost. You know, and what a more preferable option that moves the project forward is you have, well, you know, you have someone saying, okay, we will front you the cost, but you're going to try to reduce the cost instead of, and so, you know, you, you kind of approach it that way in that you have somebody bankrolling it behind you. And I say somebody or some account, you know what I mean? And so that that's kind of where we need the towns, you know, the towns help with the CPA. And then you, then you apply for these other grants knowing that you're moving forward and you're going to be able to do these other kind of things, but that's the, the push. And politically, I don't know, Ben, I don't mean to step on your toes on this. I mean, this is, it's, right. your baby. it's the next it's the next step needs a, some we need to push somebody right and and i and i'm hoping that we we do receive funding to cover the cost of the project but our efforts to reduce that cost once that funding is received wouldn't just stop there obviously you know we would want to be able to return as much money back to the town as is realistically possible you know and and so that would be that would be the ultimate goal. It's just, you know, there's so many unknowns right now from from other uh, just outside unknowns. And and we had lined up some um, some other grants, school based grants to support the playground project in the past couple of years. But that money has been reallocated to support the general budget. Um, so that's you know something that we've had to face as well. And and though and that amount of money supporting the the local, the general budget, you know, would not have been a deal breaker in moving the project forward, but you know, every little bit does, does add up. It was definitely tough yesterday listening to the, the Franklin tech presentation where it's like, yeah, we, we had a $3 million project, but uh, we turned it into a lesson plan and we're gonna have the students do it. I, I was, I was jealous. I'm like, can't we teach these third graders to weld? Uh, darn it. But, uh, you know, uh, absolutely, you know, reaching out to, to community volunteers and, and Peter, to your point about, uh, you know, if anyone's listening out there in the community, uh, any kind of know-how in terms of landscaping, construction, architecture stuff, you know, reaching out to parents or friends of parents, uh, by all means, uh, let us know, let Ben know. And, and I think with the, with the reductions that have happened so far so like the removal of the chain link fence that's going to be done by volunteers in the town department at at no cost 
removal of the safety surface and shipping it off to a, a local company. That's going to be done at, at no cost. Really, the, the prices that are left for this project are the material things, right? So the actual port in place, the asphalt, the, the play structure, those are the really the big ticket items. And, and yeah, like when, when we do have more, when we do have that money lined up, we'll then be able to line up volunteers. I just don't know how much additional money that would save the, the overall cost of the cost of the project. What do you, Peter, maybe you know the answer. How much money is Sunderland having its CPA? And what are the competitive projects? Is it, is it that kind of politics? I mean, I'm just looking at Deerfield's got millions in their CPA. And, you know, they're, they're, they're spending it on, on recreation and things for, you know what I mean? So it's kind of like, you know, yeah, community the, pressure, you know what I mean? That I kind of thing. What, ben, do you know that? Is somebody on the answer? I don't, I don't know the exact total. Peter, is it around eight, eight or $900,000? Yeah, um, I think they've got, I think they got four or five hundred thousand that's not allocated to anything. Okay, and then they've got some that sort of, you know, it's been allocated, but it hadn't been spent yet. Um, they've got about, they got three or four other projects for this year that have been proposed, but they aren't real big ticket ones. Um, I, You know, my gut feeling is that we can, we're not going to, we're not going to get shut out, but the question is, are they willing to, you know, how big a number are they going to be willing to swallow? Um, and, you know, it's, it's like how you make a, you know, what's your credibility in, in making a statement that, well, you know, we need this in order to get the project going, but then we're going to save money or, you know, as much as we can, you know, without having something in writing that says here, we're going to, you know, hard and fast commit to knocking another 50, 75, $100,000 off this thing. Cause we can't do that at this point. Um, so I think they got lots of money. The question is whether they're used to having lots of money and comfortable with spending some of it. I don't, you know, we'll have to see, but I guess, you know, the worst thing you can do is not ask. And I guess the, the other option I haven't even considered, even talked about is do you, do you, do you take a loan in order to get it done? You know what I mean? Um, and are there any community partnership banks and such that will do a, you know, do a loan so that you can get this done over multiple years of CPA money? You know, say, okay, we were able to get a loan. The CPA is going to pay the loan over, you know, we want a hundred thousand, you know, you will do a hundred thousand dollars a year over whatever, how many years and you kind of do it that way. So we don't absorb all of that, but you get the project done. Which is also, I don't know, these are all areas of, of finance I don't know the laws around and that kind of stuff. But I think as as Greg just said, if you're watching and you just happen to be a board banker or you, <laughs> or you know someone who is, um, you know, is there, you know, those kind of, uh, those kind of avenues. Yeah, I, I don't think that, I mean, I think, it, to me, it's like, yeah, as you said about Deerfield, Deerfield's got a ton of money sitting aside in its CPA account and we've got a significant amount and it's just a question of, you know, making the case so that they're willing to say, yeah, this needs to be done. And and the, the, the funny thing is that where was, there's also see a totally different committee, Capital Planning Committee, and I'm on the Capital Planning Committee. And um, I joined it about the time that the ADA report was getting finalized. Okay. And so we had, um, I think it was three years ago, this budget season, that the discussion at the Capital Planning Committee was, um, do we want to make an application for an ADA grant? And I sort of looked at the things in the ADA report and a whole lot of them, it was like, hey, you know, it really wasn't all that exciting about, you know, how are we going to write an exciting grant about upgrading of parts of a bathroom or something like this? And it wasn't, you know, sort of the, the playground wasn't quite on the, on the, on the radar screen at that point. And then two years ago, having decided that we hadn't made any application the year before that, that, uh, you know, I heard from a couple people, though, I totally did not expect it that said, you know, the one thing here that had, I think it was rock Warner said, the one thing here that really has got sex appeal is the early childhood playground. He says, and I think maybe we ought to just put in a application for that to the, for the ADA grant. 
Um, and this was again this time of year, and the and the, you know the problem was that okay, so you had six months to get the grant in, but before that, be, because the thing required that the work be done in the year of the grant is issued, you didn't have time to line up the rest of the funding. And so two years ago, it was like yeah, there was enthusiasm for it at least on the capital planning committee, but no path forward to to move forward in that grant cycle. Okay, and then one year ago. Well, COVID just hit and it, you know, it just dropped by the wayside for a while. So, you know, now we're back and, you know, I just think we have to, we have to make as good a case we can tomorrow evening and maybe a month from tomorrow evening, because I, I doubt if we're going to, if they're going to give us anything like the number that Ben is showing there, they're probably going to want to sit on it for another month while they think about it some, but they have the time to do that. I'm just guessing here about process, but, um, you know, I will see. I mean, that's where we're heading now. At least I think we're, you know, we're back, we're out there, you know, pitching something rather than just sort of sitting back and waiting for something to come to us. So I think that's good. And, you know, Ben, like I said, has done a bunch of work here to get us this far. So we'll see what happens. As far as your thing about borrowing money, I don't, you know, I don't know. That seems like a stretch and uh, you know, we'll get to it. Some the other thing I want to get to at some point here is the idea of a town having a capital plan uh, that's been talked about in the last month or two a bunch, and I don't think the playground fits into uh, that. You know, borrowing for that, I would I think that would be a stretch. Um, you know, there I think the idea is what do our buildings need in the way of uh, significant work um, that. Uh, you know, I mentioned this in my in my email to Shelley today that uh, you know we need to be figuring out for the school what things in the building, and I would start, assume we start with windows and who knows what else that we want to, you know, when the town says in a week or two, hey guys, what do you need that we're ready to jump? Okay, because I think I think the project is likely enough to happen that it's going to be pursued up to some decision point, and that means seeing what items we're going to put on the list of stuff we want to get done that so we need to get our work done there because scott keeps bringing it up at select board meetings okay he really does it's not you know i pushed it at a couple, at a couple capital planning committee meetings a couple of times but then he's been pushing it every selectman meeting now for the last month so i think it's an opportunity there but not for the playground Anyway, tomorrow night we'll see how, what sort of progress we make. And right, Ben? Keith, just wondering when is the application for the ADA grant due? Um, it's sometime like in the vicinity of September. Yeah, the the application uh, season opens up in late August and extends to mid October. And then uh, those who are awarded the grant are notified in December. So we've got time to put the grant together, assuming that we get some right. funding to make it sure that we could complete the project in the year. Right. And, and the hope that we would receive enough funding that we would be able to move forward with the project, whether or not we receive the ADA grant. Jessica? Ben, when you're looking at ways to uh, reduce the expenses of it, did you look at the sourcing of the playground equipment itself? Are we buying it through the design group at a markup? And would it be possible to avoid that? So I don't, um, I don't know that exact answer and whether or not like the design group gets a kickback for what, what is being purchased, um, but I can um, explore that a little bit more. I know, I know some of the items are purchased off the, the state contract bid list, which helps to uh, reduce the cost a, a, as well. Um, and they've been pretty open and forthcoming about, you know, what the best prices are for specific pieces of equipment. Basically, when, when you see a, a play structure that costs $60,000, the actual cost of that is around 30000 and then you have to factor in shipping and and labor and additional materials, you know, 
pouring the concrete pads that, that add to the cost. Yeah, and, and I don't know if you guys know we're doing a similar project up in Conway, which would only which will make Ben pull his hair out <clears throat> because they've already funded the two hundred fifty thousand, and they're asking for another hundred and thirty to finish off the job later this week. And so <clears throat> we are using we're seeing the similar numbers of price structures and that kind of stuff. So that's you know just kind of saying we're we're doing this in multiple places. But it was, it was funny when I um when I heard that Conway had received funding. That exact same week, I was looking at ways to reduce the cost of the pollinator seed mix for the raised garden beds. <laughs> oh. <laughs> we're, we're so I was just looking through the budget again, knowing a couple of the things that I've been involved with with Conway, and I don't, maybe I'm missing it, but is there a cost in here for a designer? And for some of the other things that you're going to have to do as far as bid requirements and advertising costs with bids and those pieces. I'm sorry, I should have thought this earlier. Are you talking no, about I'm, I'm, I'm asking Ben, based yeah. on some of the stuff that Conway has had to do, just is that factored in here? We, we've paid the design company approximately 75% or around 15 or 16,000 of uh, through is like a four or five step process of their involvement. Um, as far as the, the, the next phase, which is the, like the, the documents are ready for putting it out to bid. Um, I could look through my e emails to see what exactly has been paid for, but I think they would, we'd still be owing them another four to $5,000. So yeah, that's in, in the back of my head, but I, I haven't included that on the on the spreadsheet. Okay. All right. Uh, well, again, we'll uh, be rooting for you at the uh, community preservation meeting and uh, on to school choice. You again, Ben. Well, I'll, I'll introduce it for you, Ben. So each year we have to decide if we're going to become a school choice school. Um, we have to formally notify DESE of that, and that takes a vote of school committee. Um, as part of that, we have also done the principal gives an outline of, um, I'm telling you this all this year, because they're all veterans. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, but the uh, Ben gives an outline of what he's looking, projecting. This is an unknown year, like most, unlike any other year we've had before it. So. Ben's going to explain why he has little alligators eating the ones. Sure. And I'm just going to pull it up. So the school choice uh, recommendations is that, as Darius said, the little alligators eating the ones. Um, and, and Darius, can you, can you speak to this a little bit? Um, in years past, we had included like zero openings uh, at some grade levels. But I, I believe we, if we are going to be a school choice uh, school, we need to have at least one in case students move out mid-year and their families wish for them to continue at Sunderland. Is that is that the case? Yeah, we ran into we ran into a, we ran into a problem where we had a student in a. I'm not sure if it was this district or it was Deerfield, um, where we it was a zero opening grade level, and then a family moved out in like let's say March or April, and they said, can we continue to work, be remote? I mean, can we not remote? Can we continue to attend our child? Um, you know, so to not interrupt them, you know, I think it was a divorce situation, that kind of thing. So, you know, the child was the, you know, say the victim in the move kind of deal. And we said, oh, you absolutely can stay on. And then we said, wait a minute, that's just no school choice opens in that class. So moving forward, we always want to at least have the ability for the principal discretion to have one child add to a class in case you had a you know, several people moving out or unique situations, um, that, that, that kind of discretion. So um, just to keep it clean moving forward. We were right. able to <laughs> and, and we have just one in each grade level for next school year is just be because there are so many unknowns. We don't know what the fall is going to look like at this point. We don't know who's going to be moving in, um, you know, over, over the next few months and, and over the summer. Uh, if you look at the kindergarten number, the projected class size, that's actually not um, exactly the case of 11. We, we do have four 
um, pending applications of school choice siblings. So that would br bring it up to 15. Um, just in the past couple of days, we've had an additional two uh, families uh, who are who are not who are not on our radar request kin kindergarten applications, and that brings us up to seven uh, seventeen. And then there are a couple, probably two to three more possibilities as well, which brings our number to kinder of kindergarten closer to twenty. So that number um, of all grade levels tends to fluctuate the most, and so that's why at this point um, we're still recommending two classes at the kindergarten level. Earlier, I had spoke about the first grade, uh, the upcoming first grade class, which between the two kindergarten classes right now has a total of 16 students. And so we'd be looking to move to one, one section next year. And then you can see the other uh, school choice applications that we have in the other grade levels. Um, school choice, when we accept for a grade level, it's it's not just based on the numbers, it's based on the needs in that particular group. And we have some cohorts of students that come through where their class sizes might be a little bit smaller, um, but just the, the profile of the, the students uh, re requires some more additional resources. So we wouldn't necessarily be recommending school choice slots for that, for that grade level. Uh, any, any questions? Go ahead, Keith. I'm still a little confused by alligators. Uh, so you're, you're recommending one per grade level, or like what? What, what exactly are we? Am I looking at? Um, so we are we are recommending that we be a uh, serve a, act as a school choice school for for next school year, and um, you know with and kind of giving me the discretion along with discussions that I have with with teachers that if we are to accept some students we'd be taking a look at at the needs and also based on in, the information we don't necessarily have as to what next year is going to exactly look like um, have that be one of the determining factors as well okay so it's that we're going to be accepting school choice at most grade levels we're just not determining an exact number right now um, like with, so like with the, the first grade, classroom at 16 would that be one that we would be hesitant about yeah we would not um we would not be accepting any applications school choice applications for first grade okay but we do have to include the number one um like De darius talked about uh, just a couple minutes ago and the alligator eats the greater it's greater the alligator Peter? eats the greater amount because the alligator is always hungry Yeah, Peter, go ahead. Um, I think uh, we need a motion to, I'll make a motion to, uh, um, what do we have to say here? That uh, move that Sunderland participate in the school choice program for fiscal year 22. Second. All right. Any more discussion? All right. Uh, in that case, we'll move to a vote. Uh, Keith? Yes. Uh, Maisie? Yes. Peter? Yes. Jessica? Yes. Greg? Yes. You're muted, Greg. All right. Do we have any reports? I know we've heard from Ben plenty. Was Darius, do you have anything else? Any collaborative? Any uh, meeting on in like two weeks? Uh, sounds like we're ready to take a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. I'll second. second. Okay, all right. Good deal. Uh, all right, Maisie. Yes. Jessica? Yes. Peter? Yes. Greg? Yes. Keith? Yes. Outstanding. All right. Unanimous. Thank you all. Thank you. Have a good night.